Okay, so you've all got your handouts and you've all turned your cell phones off, is that right? Okay, um, we're going we're gonna to keep those handouts uh, handy. <laughs> That's not my head. So everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> oh, that was for me. <laughs> We're going to talk about the church, the Corinthian church today, um, and I think a lot of it will echo in your own uh, churches. Uh, the Corinthian church is really the only letter that we have, the Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians is the only letters that we have where Paul really gets into the nitty gritty of their church life and all the issues that they're dealing with. So it's a, it's a rather eye-opening window into... Uh, early Christianity, and particularly this community in the city of Corinth in Greece. Um, these letters are written in, in the mid-50s at the time. It is a very different picture of early Christianity than what you get in the first couple of chapters of Acts, um, uh, in the, uh, the, which is a Jerusalem community there. Uh, that picture in Acts is a perfect picture of what is called in Greek the canonia, did I say that right? Canonia, kind of close? Oh, that, so that wasn't right, but close enough. Which means one of the meanings is to share. And that word share appears over and over again in this very brief description of this Acts community. Um, we are told that all believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. And they sold their property and possessions and they shared that money with those that were in need. And they worshiped together in the temple all in every day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper where they shared that meal together with great joy and great generosity. And it's that word generosity that doesn't quite uh, come out in the Corinthian group. <laughs> and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That's the Acts description. And that tells me that what they were doing was very attractive, and people really wanted to come and join. And it's that sense of unity and canonia and sharing. There is an echo. Uh, okay. Paul's Corinth group, on the other hand, is rife with conflict and tension. Newly minted in their faith, mostly Gentiles, okay? So they're, they're, not, they're new at all this. They're making themselves up as they go along, and they're really struggling to hold it together as a group. For example, one of the members believes that his new Christian freedom allows him to have a sexual relationship with his uh, stepmother. <clears throat> in, <laughs> in today's individualistic culture, someone might say, you know, as long as it's between two consenting adults, what does it matter? But to Paul, it really did matter. And he laments that that member considers it irrelevant. What impact that relationship has on the other members? What impact that relationship has on the health of the whole church body? Let alone, what is the perception of that church in the public mind? And so all of those have to do with that larger church body. Other members are suing their fellow church members in court, bringing shame on the church. Um, still others, the Gentile believers, are eating pagan meat. And uh, Jamie mentioned this yesterday. Uh, this is meat sold at pagan temples in front of their fellow Jewish members. And they, they, the Jewish members considered that deeply offensive. And then there are the, are the wealthier members who are eating this sumptuous meal for the Lord's Supper, when they celebrate the Lord's Supper, and they're getting drunk. And then when the, uh, the poorer members who are laboring all day, and they're weary, and they come to the Lord's Supper, at the end of the day, there's no food left, and everyone's drunk. <laughs> <clears throat> Paul calls these wealthy members unworthy of commemorating the death, okay? Jesus' death in the Lord's Supper. And he tells them that if they eat and drink without discerning the body, they will eat and drink judgment against themselves. And that's my workshop this afternoon, if you want to look at that in detail. There are other issues as well. There's ongoing tension about the demeanor of women in worship. 
There's also division among members depending upon who baptizes who. Some of those baptized believe that now that they're baptized, their salvation is assured and they can do anything they want. <laughs> and then there are the arrogant, proud of their exceptional spirituality and dismissive or demeaning of those that they don't think measure up to that same standard of spirituality. <clears throat> Paul very um, sarcastically calls these individuals um, super apostles. I think we all have super apostles in our churches, maybe. I can think of some. And he points out, but he points out that their spirituality is merely in service to their egos. Tradition has depicted Paul as a bald man. Did you know that? And I can understand why it's from tearing his hair out over the Corinthians. <laughs> I was thinking of that with all the details and the issues in the Corinthian church, that it would take it would make a great HBO drama, uh, or a, a masterpiece theater, maybe? Reality show. Reality show, yes, that's even better. We think that was then and now is now, but I'm remembering how challenging it was in our own Christian science beginnings, if you could remember. And I, I'm, we surely treasure all the dynam dynamic aspects, the, the living aspects, the healing aspects, um, uh, and the spiritual growth that took place under Mrs. Eddy's leadership in those early times. But I think as in Corinth, so in our own early beginnings, there were also some woeful examples of a lack of discernment of the church body that actually parallel some of these Corinthian, Corinthian examples uh, of members suing one another, uh, even suing Mary Baker Eddy of strange sexual matters like the practitioner or teacher who claimed that her baby was a virgin birth. That's part of our story. Um, there were divisions among members upon who was taught by who. Again, that echoes Corinthians and pride in one's exceptional spirituality. So I, I was just seeing parallels between the two groups. <clears throat> Paul had spent, going back to Paul, he had spent several tireless years establishing the Corinth community. And then he went off to evangelize elsewhere and very soon found letters and people coming back and telling stories about the disarray and dysfunction in the Corinthian church. So he writes them this anguish letter to remind them that they are called into the canonia, the sharing, the fellowship with Jesus Christ, our Lord. But instead of Canonia, many of the Corinthians were busy buying into the individualistic culture of the Corinth city, the city. It's a major port. It has a reputation for immorality. There's all kinds of people coming through. And Corinth seems to have been a place where people had more freedom to determine their own individual economic and social destinies. Uh, it just had that reputation. Of course, it wasn't all discord. We have this wonderful, idealized picture of early Christian beginnings in Acts. And even in Paul's letters, there's some wonderful example of a sense of canonia and common purpose. And the example that I want to uh, share with you is from the letter of the uh, Philippians. And the, the church in Philippi was dearly beloved by Paul. He loved this church. And I'd like us to read it together. And it's number one on your handout. So let's pull that up. <clears throat> uh, I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing, Canonia, in the gospel from the first day until now. I love that. And in, and in his letters, Paul lifts up this sense of fellowship, his hope for the fellowship among the members. But he also is really focusing on the fellowship of Christ. And he knows because it, that fundamental relationship with Christ is what is the founding, the, the grounding for the fellowship with each other. And I, I was looking at this um, bit that was handed out yesterday, this wonderful bit Christian Science, Christian's Healing Practice by Shirley Paulson. The very first line, and this is written for everybody, the public. 
She says, in the ecumenical setting, Christians define their pilgrimage in a variety of ways, but the power that draws them together is the agreement that Christ's salvific work is the destination. It's that common canonia with Christ, the saving activity of the Christ that unites them. And Paul knew that very clearly. So then I thought and I asked myself, what does the fellowship with Christ look like? And what I did is I went to the uh, NIB, the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary, um, that's a 12 volume, and I looked up the one on uh, uh, Gail O'Day's commentary on the Gospel of John. I love, love, love Gail O'Day and her insights. Because the passage in there in John 17 is the basis of this conference, and the conference is on unity and canonia. And I was really interested in what she had to say about it uh, to figure out what fellowship with Christ looks like. And the passage that we have for this conference is out of a prayer that Jesus is, Jesus is praying in his last moments before he's arrested. In the Gospel of John, he's praying to his father, and the disciples are just sitting around the table and listening to him praying to his father. Uh, O'Day points that out. Let's just reacquaint ourselves with that prayer. This is number two. Let's read it together. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. You know, that is a beautiful, beautiful prayer. Jesus asked his father, not only on behalf of the disciples that are sitting at that table, but on behalf of all those who believe in him through his disciples' word, meaning those who have been evangelized by his disciples, which means us, too. That we, he said, I say we because it includes us, may all be one. Note that Jesus is not at this moment giving them instructions how do you unite together? How do you work together? He's not doing that. Instead of instructing his disciples, he asked God to give his disciples what he and his father have already. And that's a living relationship. In fact, more than a relationship because Jesus is in communion. He's, he has a sense of oneness with his Abba Father. So rather than a connection with God, they are in communion together. And communion is another translation of that word, canonia. About a year ago, I was having lunch with uh, five other women, um, and we were talking about our spiritual lives. And I shared with them that I had a long life of church work and committee work and Bible study and reading the lesson and the Christian science periodicals and everything. But I was just waking up to the idea that I didn't feel like I had a real relationship with God, that God was really, really real to me in any kind of profound or intimate level. And I felt like the psalmist who said, as the deer longs for the running streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? Isn't that the most beautiful yearning? You could just feel that yearning, and that's the way I was feeling. And when I said that to this group of women, another woman in the group just burst out in tears. She just bawled, and we were just taken aback. She just bawled, and she said, Oh, that's me, that's me. That's what I'm longing for, and I can't find it. And it was just breaking her up. And it just really struck me. I never forgot that moment because I was thinking how powerful that is 
to have that sense of longing. And one of the things that Gail O'Day, one of her insights in this commentary about this relationship with God, that Jesus is praying that we, need to, we can have too, is she says that unity is not something that the church has to fabricate or create. She said, she said rather unity arises out of our affinity. And affinity is the word kinship. We're kin. Our affinity or kinship with that primal unity between father and son. It arises out of that. Remember that Jesus prays to his father that they, meaning we, may also be in us, in that father and son. He's praying not that we as an outside observer should connect to that us or, or associate with it or think about it or even pray to it, but that we be in that us called father and son. Um, it's, like, it's like being in a living relationship, but then I thought, no, it's more like being in a live-in <laughs> relationship. As Jesus puts it, that the love with which you, Father, have loved me may be in them and I in them. Can't you feel that oneness? We are all in this together. We are all kin. That sense of communion. And I thought, wow, if we had that, that's all we would need. And people would come flocking. People would come flocking, or we would go out and flock with them. As Jamie said, that orientation needs to switch. Um, that sense of love and intimacy between the Father and the Son, if we were in that and that was in us, how attractive that would be, how compelling that would be. And what would be the point of it? As Richard pointed out, the world is the point of that unity. The world in John 17, Jesus prays that we may all be one so that the world may believe uh, that you have sent me. The purpose of the community's oneness and unity uh, for, is for the world to make visible and tangible the love of God. So the whole purpose of our fellowship, our canonia, is that the world may know God. That's it. It's beautiful. But the Corinthians just get, didn't get that. They just didn't get that. Most of them didn't grasp that their life together had that larger sense of purpose. So Paul's aim is to reorient them from what can Christ do for me to what can we do for Christ for the sake of the world. Okay. In focusing on that we part that fellowship or canonia part, Paul comes up with a description of the church as the living body of Christ. Not just the body of Christ, the living body of Christ. And we are all members. In Romans 12, Paul speaks of the different gifts of the or ministries of the body members, some prophets, some ministering, some caring for one another, some leaders, some giving, some preaching, some teaching. In other words, we are the body's arms when we reach out and embrace those who walk in the doors. We are the body's feet when we walk with the weary. We are the body's heart speaking tenderly to the fearful. We are the body's mind preaching and teaching the word. We are the body's arms embracing those. Let's read number three from Ephesians. The church is the body's body in which he speaks and acts, and by which he fills everything with his presence. You can see that. Have you ever thought of church that way? It's a wonderful way to think of it. Appreciating each other's gifts can be a challenge in the church, as we know. And interestingly, Paul is often ambivalent about these gifts in the church. He knows that the people's gifts, their ministries, are a sense of power for the church. They're a source of that power for the church. But on the other hand, because they are sources of power, they can often be, you know, become liabilities in a way because people interpret their gifts in an individualistic way and they brag about them or they claim, claim, claim credit about them. And this is what's so brilliant about the body metaphor that Paul comes up with. It really resolves this, this uh, challenge of bragging. 
Most of us don't brag out loud, but I think we brag inside, don't we? <laughs> he tells them that, Christ that in Christ's body, some of the most insignificant members are actually the most essential part for the whole overall functioning of the body. Let's read number four where he says this. The members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. Did you notice when you were reading that, that Paul here, in speaking about the members, says, he says those members that seem to be weaker. Do you see that? And uh, those who we think are less honorable. I don't, you know, this is from the message. I don't know if that's actually in the Greek, but it certainly works for me. We can all think of those in the church that we give greater deference to and perhaps those that we treat more lightly. <laughs> but you know, Paul also, also directly addresses here uh, an issue in the church, a problem, a challenge in the church that I think is more present than we might imagine, and that's low self-esteem. And that low self-esteem might even be within our own thought that we are undeserving or unworthy um, to be honored in the community. And, but Paul is very explicit here that all members are equally important and essential for the functioning of the body. When I was in Southern Africa, I was in Swaziland, uh, which was a neighbor uh, to South Africa uh, for almost 10 years. And the country at the time when I was there was going through the process of shaking the dust of apartheid off its feet. And during apartheid, the whites literally had the best and highest standard of living in the world at that time. Uh, but it was on the backs of the backs, the back of the backs, <laughs> Of the, of the people of color, whom many of the whites uh, deemed to be inferior. What became crystal clear to me as an observer of this process, and history bore this out, is that no society can be healthy and endure if it's living at the expense of another. And that goes for the church as well. It may appear that way, but it cannot last. It cannot endure because we are all one. So hurting another is hurting ourselves. And the same goes for the body of Christ. Let's read Paul again that talks about this. This is number five. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ, for in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one mind member is honored, all rejoice together with it. So if one member is honored, we all rejoice together with it, so there's no place for envy in that as well. Paul explains that God has set up the rules in such a way that their gifts have to work together interdependently, cooperatively, every member's spiritual well-being dependent on all the other members. So let's read again, number six. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And let's go on to number seven. This is from the message. A body isn't a single part, 
blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If the body is all I, how could it hear? So no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. We each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life. Each of us is now a part of Christ's resurrection body. I want you to think about how that makes you more significant, not less. And I love that last line. You're actually more significant as a whole body than you are as an individual member. And I also love that line where it says, if we're all I, how could we hear? Because the I represents our own perspective. So if we're all full of ourselves, we're not going to hear what somebody else is saying. Now, as an aside, in Colossians and Ephesians, which are letters that are second generation, Paul, most scholars agree with that. I don't know. Do you agree with that, Jamie? So yes, no. That's still in, under debate. But anyway, they in that there, the Paul's metaphor is adapted so that Christ is the head of the body, and not just the the whole body. And so that makes a great point too. It, that it unifies the body under Christ's head, so that we're not all individual bodies with our own heads, <laughs> but that we're individual members where the mind of Christ is is our our at the top, at the head. Um, and so let's read Ephesians, number eight. I'm walking you through these because there's, there's great lessons in here. Speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. So clearly, if any member isn't working properly, it affects the whole body. But Christ is the head of the body. Well, I, it doesn't work as well for me because that makes the head a little bit more remote and removed and elevated above all the other members. And that's why I like Paul's metaphor where Christ is the whole body, where so every member, Christ is found in every member of the body. And Paul's body me metaphor then, therefore, holds no distinction between those members, or I would say between priest or practitioner and laity. <laughs> and you have to remember that it was the priest, remember, that took over the head of the church body uh, within Christian history, too. There was that distinction. So I actually prefer um, and affiliate more with Paul's metaphor as Christ as the whole body because it doesn't allow for hierarchy or status or authority or spirituality, of a hierarchy of any of those. And it beautifully illustrates unity in diversity. But it's not a unity of sameness, isn't it? Is it? Not at all. It is a unity that does not emerge out of a regimented sameness or conformity. In fact, the body depends upon diversity. It depends upon that diversity of functions to be healthy. Each member of the body depends upon the interplay of all the gifts and ministries and, and strengths of each of those members. It means that if any of these members separated from the body, it would be like an amputated limb, lifeless. And note that the church is Christ's resurrection body. It's the living body. None of this would work if the faithful did not understand that Christ resurrected into the church. So they, uh, in the church, like Christ, make up a living body. That means it's ever-changing. <laughs> there is something very corporate and organic about this body of Christ that I just love. And anyone who's ever heard of a band... Uh, maybe a, a high school band trying to play and get their their song together, and it's very uh, they struggle to play that song well. But even if each one of those individual musicians 
knew music theory perfectly and knew every note in that song sheet perfectly, it's, they still wouldn't make music, would they? The result is not necessarily musical because harmony only happens when each member of the orchestra plays in relationship with all the other members, with a constant awareness of what all the other musicians are doing in that orchestra. So synchronicity is not about individuality. It's about discerning the body, discerning the body of the orchestra. Everyone playing in full relationship to everybody else, interdependent, interconnected. This is what Paul means to discern the body. Let's read number nine. <laughs> to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. By the way, I would recommend taking all these wonderful Paul quotes home and you can make a Wednesday reading out of them. <laughs> <laughs> to summarize what Paul's body, body metaphor is saying is that Christian unity neither requires uniformity nor even encourages uniformity. Being different is, is absolutely necessary for the richness and the vigor of the church body, the wholeness. The unity comes, as I mentioned before, in that unification around the one body of Christ, a body that died for us, in a way. That's, that's the unity there. And then rose from death to become the living church. Are you with me so far? Okay. As mentioned, living with difference is really hard, as we all know. I think it's, I think it's part of God's plan, though. But difference has, an, has, and has always been with us from the earliest, earliest times, even if you go back to that wonderful, harmonious community and acts that I described in the beginning. That was uh, just a picture of harmony, but they were forced then to deal with diversity because Paul came walking into their midst. And, and I think, again, that was God's idea, wasn't it? Wasn't it God's idea to bring him into the picture? You bet. And he brought along all his difference. And fortunately, Paul finds a home in the Antioch church in Syria. Um, he was there for quite a, a, a while. And that was a church that was kind of a pioneer church. It was astoundingly innovative in its day. Um, a church with no apartheid between Jews and uncircumcised Gentiles. They ate together. They worshiped together. Um, they mixed freely. And even Peter will come and visit them and join in with that mixing. But the Jerusalem community is suspicious of what's going on in Antioch, and they're suspicious of Paul. And one of the first things I think that, you know, the Jerusalem community is run by um, James, the brother of Jesus, and Peter's there, a very prominent member. These are apostles. It's in Jerusalem, the city of the, uh, the center of the world at that time. And... Um, they are suspicious of Paul, maybe even because of his apostleship, his claim to apostleship, because why should they listen to him? They, they, that was a, a always controversial. Um, so they withdraw. Um, they send an inspection party who puts pressure on Peter, who then withdraws from the mixing and the eating with Gentiles. Peter changes his mind. Um, David Bosch, the scholar David Bosch, he has a Wonderful book out. I don't know if you know it, Jamie. Um, it's on mission, and it's, it's a South African. He says, it's clear that the Jerusalem group's concern was not mission, but consolidation. Not grace, but law. Not crossing frontiers, but fixing them. Not life, but doctrine. Not movement, but institution. And the Jerusalem community's misgivings about Paul were totally understandable really. Um, they were deeply faithful Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And they believed that their Christ mission was limited to the nation of Israel, the house of Israel. Their Hebrew Bible told them that the Gentiles would be saved, but at the end of time, when all of the Gentiles would make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So it is their own self-definition that makes it impossible for them to embark on a mission 
to those outside of that house of Israel. And it makes me ask my own question. What are my own self-definitions that might um, cause the Holy Spirit to circumvent around me or around my church um, that might force the Holy Spirit to take up residence elsewhere because of my own self-confined, encamped uh, definitions. And that is a, an interesting question for me to ask. But I wanted to also say that after much debate, as you probably know, James did accommodate Paul and his mission. But I, I think they made an agreement that they could only, Paul would, would proselytize not in Jerusalem, but outside in the greater uh, Mediterranean Roman world. Um, and, and really, he, they, were not, they were concerned that he would not upset the Jewish members there. So, um, and I wanted to emphasize that this is a huge decision for them. Let me say that twice. This was a huge decision for them to accommodate Paul. And I think it's an outstanding example for us of how the church can accommodate huge differences among ourselves being side by side together. Uh, working together, each doing what they feel called to do uh, and accommodating one another. And in a sense, the church trusted providence <laughs> to sort out those differences um, and who would, what, what kind of approach would prevail. But resistance to Paul still lingers even after this agreement between James and Paul is made. Um, there is a small party um, which Paul names the circumcision faction that goes out and follows Paul around. Paul and Barnabas are sent out into the Mediterranean world to evangelize by the Antioch church, and this Jerusalem faction, the circumcision faction, will follow him around trying to undo some of his works. Um, Paul speaks of a thorn in his flesh, and I think it might have been this faction that, that uh, plagued him. Like this faction, a lot of us, again, find it very difficult um, to deal with other people's differences. Uniformity and homogeneity are uh, much more comfortable if we look and vote alike. We can all be harmonious and get along together. Um, how often have we silenced our own, our own differences? Because um, it would cause inharmony in the church. I think that's happened more than we would like to admit. But we know that any attempt to force people into a particular mold fails. Um, and we may have experienced what happens in a church when someone tries to herd all the members, H-E-R-D, like sheep, to herd them in one direction. Uh, sooner or later, that breaks down, and often dramatically. As Paul, metaf body metaphor says so simply, let's look at number 10. Let's read it. If all were one single member, where would the body be? It's just such a simple, you know, all my words, and there's this one sentence, oh yeah. Even Paul, as open as he was, still struggled with diversity in his myths, and he allows the members to freely express their ministries as long as they're governed by the rubric, the standard, so to speak, the measuring rod of Christ crucified, meaning that their actions have to arise out of unselfishness and love and service. Yet even that rubric isn't met perfectly. Um, it, even if that rubric is not met perfectly to his own specifications, he still is able to let go I know sometimes he's, as Jamie was saying yesterday, uh, you say tomato, I say tomato, and since I say tomato, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> and Paul is often like that, especially when it comes to circumcision of Gentiles. But um, there are other examples, and this one I really love, again, from the church in Philippi. Let's read number 11. He wrote this when you, uh, letter from prison. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rival but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. 
and others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and imprisonment. What does it matter, just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I continue to rejoice. So you just kept saying that over and over again in your head in church now, from now on. <laughs> Paul is keenly aware of all the egos at play in this church, is he not? Perhaps he's even keenly aware of his own ego at play, and yet we find him rejoicing because they are unified in proclaiming Christ. And just so in our own churches, we can, despite our differences, we can rejoice because we are all proclaiming Christ, no matter what kind of motivations we might assign to someone else. <laughs> the necessity of both diversity and unity for the body of Christ is actually sort of imprinted. It mirrors spiritual reality. It's imprinted in the pattern of reality. Because remember that our Bible has the creator that has begins with one God as creator of all, right? And this means there's one source, from out of one source comes all, and all is but the same one. So all of us, on an essential level, are identical in God's oneness. And that's why we feel a constant pull to come together, because of that oneness, this constant spiritual pull. Let's read number 12, which cultivates in the church that deeper level of oneness as we found in the Ephesians. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, Paul, who is above all and through all, and in all. But on the other hand, <laughs> there is this vast diversity within creation. You know, no two snowflakes are alike. So there seems to be this counterbalancing, pulling apart, where we're always trying to distinguish ourselves from one another. So you have this pulling together and pulling apart tension that seems to be actually embedded in creation itself. And it's played out in God's saving action as you find in the Bible. This pulling apart appears in the uniqueness of Israel. God selects Israel. God sets Israel apart um, and her vision. And that highlights her exclusiveness, does it not? Yet the purpose of God's election of Israel is to what? To be a blessing, yes, and to bring all nations to the light. And this is because the God of Israel that selected Israel is also the creator of all. The creator of all. So there's the pulling together is based on the creator as concerned with the nation of Israel as, as they are concerned with the whole of creation. It's God's intention that all of creation should be celebrating God's loving redemption and liberation of the world. They should all be participating. And the prophet Isaiah is a high watermark in showing the exclusiveness, but also the inclusiveness. Let's read number 13. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people a light to the nations, that my salvation shall reach to the end of the earth. And then just briefly now, we also have Jesus, um, who is formed by Israel's story and scripture. He, like Israel, is elected by God. He is set apart. So there is that sense of the particularity of him, okay? But then he, like Israel, has to learn that God has to work through him for the saving of the whole world. And that's what his temptation is about, that it's not about him in particular. And by the way, this corporate sense of salvation is very different than the notion that developed later on in Christian history of God saving individual 
or isolated uh, people here and there. That's very different than what you get in the Bible. The God of the Bible says that humanity to be saved, um, for, that for humanity to be saved, spiritual growth has to be about collective salvation and evolution. Not, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Not just individual uh, fulfillment and salvation. And, uh, you know, you can't do it yourself without bringing everybody else along with you. The Bible makes plain that neither Israel nor Jesus can claim their own separate history independent um, from the, the rest of humanity. Rather, their histories must be understood in continuity and interdependence with the history of the nations and of all creation. Do you get that? Because that's really interesting. I think we have to remember that with Christian science. We know we're unique, and yet we live in interdependence with that larger history and that larger story and that larger connectivity, and we have are that and that purpose to serve. And so when Israel or Christians then or today forget that the purpose of their election is service, their election loses its meaning. What's the purpose of it? God's design is to unite our particularity with the universal. And I love this from William Sloan Coffin, a favorite of mine. I met him once. What a joy. He said, I brought him to, as a speaker to, to our, our foundation. He said, to put down roots, he said, uh, he said to put down roots, that, that he said that the church is to put down roots, but then to recognize that the purpose of those roots is to put forth branches. So you've got that, the particularity of the roots, but the overall inclusiveness of, of what the, the, the election is about. And with this in mind, I'd like to end with this quote, and then if we, I don't know if we have time for the video. Yes, we do. Yes. Let's end with this. This is from David Bosch again, number 14. Let's read it together. The Holy Spirit cannot be held hostage by the church, as if its sole task was to maintain the church and protect it from the outside world. The church exists only as an organic, an integral part of the entire human community. If it tries uh, um, sin as meaningful in independence from the total human community, it betrays the only purpose which can justify its existence. The church is always and only a preliminary community in route to its self-surrender into the kingdom of God. Isn't that beautiful? So this is a YouTube video that is really just perfect a summary, I think, of um, what we've just talked about. Thank you. The team is 
unit. Though it is made up of many positions, and though all of its positions are many, they form one team. So it is with Christ. If the shortstop should say, because I am not a pitcher, I do not belong to the team, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the team. And if the catcher should say, because I am not a left fielder, I do not belong to the team, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the team. If the whole team were pitcher, who would catch? If the whole team were second baseman, who would pitch? But in fact, the coach has arranged the positions on the team, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one position, where would that leave the team? As it is, there are many positions, but one team. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We win together, we lose together. You know, this is the toughest part of, of being a coach. Putting 12 guys in a lineup that has nine positions to play and deciding who bats where. A manager basically has two choices in this. <laughs> he can decide to win the game and put his best players in the best positions or he can decide to have a peaceful evening and put the guys where they want to play. I've. Uh, I've had a harder time this year getting 12 unique boys to be one unified team than I have had in the past. And, and I love my boys, they're good boys. But we've got a handful of guys that it's just hard to make into a team. I, I've got one guy who, who may be my best pitcher, but that's all he wants to do is pitch. And when he doesn't pitch, he pouts. And, and, and if he doesn't pitch, you put him in any other position and he just he doesn't like it, and he doesn't give him. He doesn't give us uh, his, his best performance. Uh, I've got another boy who is fantastic in the outfield, um, but he wants to play the infield. In the outfield, he'll catch anything close to him, but in the infield, he'll he'll, he'll dodge the balls, try to catch it without being right in front of it. Uh, so if he misses the ball, it won't hurt him. Um, He's great in the outfield, but he wants to play the infield. I, I haven't figured out why he hates what he does best. I, I got another boy that every time somebody else makes a mistake, he just scowls at them. And not that he doesn't make mistakes. In fact, he cost us a couple runs last, last game, but uh, he, he doesn't scowl at himself. I, I've got one boy who's got a, a word of criticism for everybody. And as a result of that, the other boys shy away from him because they've been hurt by what he said. And the fact that they stay away from him fuels his insecurity and his isolation and makes him lash out all the more. I've got one boy who starts real strong. But when something happens, and something always happens, and he messes up or someone else messes up, he loses his composure, he becomes unraveled. And then he begins to shake and he gets nervous and you might as well put him on the bench, although I don't because it would just hurt his ego more. I I've got one boy who, uh, who tries too hard and, and he strikes out as a result. And when he strikes out a couple times, that's all he thinks about and he's out of the game for the rest of the game mentally. You know, it's interesting. Now that I think about it, uh, the boys that practice the best teamwork are the boys that don't seem to have as much talent. They're the boys that will play anywhere I ask them to play. They're just glad to be on the team. They're glad to have an, a uniform. They'll bat anywhere in the batting order I ask them to bat. They're just glad to have a chance to hit. I love those guys. <laughs> and not that I don't love the others, but, but those guys are a joy to coach. It seems to me that the more talent a boy has, the harder it is for him to be part of a team. Because the more talent a kid has, the more he wants the opportunity to shine instead of the opportunity to win. And what I try to do as a coach is, is try to get the guys to understand that the object of baseball is to win baseball games. 
not to have individual performances that are better than somebody else's. That's a tough thing, getting 12 guys to be one team. You know what? You know what's harder than that? Getting several hundred people to understand that the church doesn't exist to serve their needs. But the church exists to serve the needs of our community. It's a hard thing to get a bunch of people to understand that this isn't about us. It's about doing what Jesus would do if he were here. But he is here. We are his body. We are the cup of cold water given his name. We are the, the clothing, the, the naked and the feeding the hungry. That's, that's, that's us. Leonard Bernstein, famous composer, said that uh, the hardest instrument to play in the whole orchestra is second fiddle. There's an innate need in each one of us to be number one, to be the starting pitcher, to bat cleanup, to drive in the game-winning RBI. But we're called to something bigger than that. We're called to be part of the body of Christ. And when we are the body of Christ, we win. He wins. Our community wins. And I gotta get back to work because I'm hoping we win tonight. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it.